What I found is this one thing that they do really, really well, all of these disruptive organizations, is they focus on what I call the future customer. Stand by. I'll be right there. Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 350. Today is Sunday the 24th of November 2019. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day for the listen. I'd also like to give a shout out and thanks for putting up a review of this show to Mitchell Douglas and Junior G. And I invite you to do the same if you would. This week's interview is with Charlene Lee. Charlene is founder and senior fellow at Altimeter, a profit company, giving business leaders the insights to thrive in the face of change. Charlene, a past guest on the show, has written or co-authored six books, the last of which is called The Disruption Mindset. In this interview with Charlene, we discuss the book. We also talk about how disruption itself has changed, when or if you can get too big to be disrupted, the role of bravery, how to go about changing culture, and a bunch more. Charlene Lee, it's wonderful to have you back on the show, a repeat offender, as we like to say. You and I have been talking about things like disruption and mindset for many years now, and and you were very kind to host at Profit a, a screening of my film in San Francisco a couple of years back. That was a wonderful event. It's great to hang out with you, Charlene, and uh, to have you back on the show. Tell us in your own words now, who you are and what you're up to. Well, my name is Charlene Lee. I have been a longtime analyst and I have been writing books. So I'm a best-selling um, author, a transformational speaker. And I have recently been uh, a founder uh, of Altimeter, which is a disruptive analyst firm. And my most recent project is to start a company called Quantum Networks. Uh, on the side that is seeking to connect the world's disruptive leaders to support them in their quest to create exponential growth in their organizations, but also in their communities and in society. And in light of the not so long ago announcement by Google uh, on quantum computing, you are presumably at the forefront uh, connecting neurons and, uh, and brains. Yes, without the technology necessarily um, all there, but just like quantum computing, quantum networks, I hope, will be exponential with each additional person coming in. And also, if you understand quantum computing, it's, it's this idea of being, a sup- being in superpositions where the power is coming from. And as a disruptive leader, you need to not only think about and have an open mindset to change, you also have to have the leadership abilities to create that change and make it happen. <laughs> It's not enough just to talk about change and wave your hands in the air, but you have to actually make that change happen to be that leader. Right. Brilliant. Well, we are going to get into that kind of a mindset. So what what brought you to this idea to write this book published in 2019, Disruption Mindset? Who's it for? Um, It's for people who want to create this change. They see the opportunity. They see the goodness that could come out of big, huge change. And they're sitting there going like, how on earth do I make this happen? Where is the playbook? Because the, the language and the literature around disruption has been all the companies that have done it wrong or the extraordinary tech companies in Silicon Valley who have done it right. Well, where is the knowledge for the rest of us, <laughs> the people <laughs> who actually work at normal companies? And so how do you actually create disruptive change, a positive force for that creates that opportunity and that change? So I said, I don't know what the answer is to that. So when I don't know the answer to something, I get very curious. I do research and a book comes out of it. Hmm. So that's what happened with this one. Great. With lots of great stories in it. So, so the, the challenge at so, so many levels is that the, underneath us is constant change. And as you look at maybe how some other company is trying to battle it, the transportability or transferability of the, what they're doing to your situation seems at best hard to bring in. And secondly, even the foundations on which we're doing this stuff is by itself changing. My question is, how, how would you describe how disruption itself has changed, let's say, over the last decade? Well, I think in the past, we would look to a particular 
uh, technology or innovation or a business model or something like where is the magic bullet? And I think when we look around and see the companies that have been able to constantly change to disrupt themselves, it's never like this one single thing. It is much more around the way they think, the way they approach the market, and the way they organize and have their culture, the way they lead. Uh, and that was the most interesting thing. Um, and what I, I found is this one thing that they do really, really well, all of these disruptive organizations, is they focus on what I call the future customer. Because it's only by having that really strong model that they were able to make the really tough decisions and sacrifices and investments they have to have today. It's the one thing that allowed them to be able to eclipse everybody else in the industry. So it sounds like customer centricity on steroids or something even more focused than this term we've been banding around for the last couple of years. Right. And I think customer centricity, customer um, obsession, all those things are great. But they, if you're not targeting the right customer, it'll keep you squarely rooted in today in, this, in maintaining the status quo. So it's not enough just to be customer centric and customer focused. You need to focus on the future customer. And, and frankly, organizations turn to me like, it's hard enough to focus on like trying to figure out what my current customer is. You want me to do that and focus on the future customer? And my answer to them is, I never said it was going to be easy. Right. But so how do this you, is the way to do it. Right. So yeah. on the one hand, there's this notion of defining who is that future customer. Right. And the, the idea of finding out who your future customer, the reason why so many custom companies do not do this. I'll be talking to 100 companies and maybe one or two kind of inch their hands up is because it's so unknown. You're not sure. You're not 100% sure this is the place to go. And we've been trained as business leaders to be 100% sure before we take action to go. And the thing about disruptive organizations to go, I'm not sure, but I have to go. It's that commitment to going hmm. to the future hmm. that keeps them alive and fresh. Well, so they just are absolutely determined to figure out who that future customer is, and they put a tremendous amount of resources against it. The interesting parallel I'm thinking about in my new book, I talk about how customer centricity is, is important and la -dee -da, but actually it's a, a mechanism to break down silos. You know, of course, you want to be centered on the customer and who is the customer, but just the process, the journey towards it is actually the disruptive component. Yes, I love that. That's a great way to think about it. And if you think about what silos are there for, they're there to preserve the status quo. And they're really necessary to promote excellence in a certain area to make sure operations smooth, uh, work smoothly. But customers, and you're talking about new customers that require you bend those silos, or as I like to put it, to break windows between those silos so that customers can pass seamlessly through them. When you have those windows there and they're really well developed, then you're able to take in new customers and you're not breaking the system. The system, the process, the organization all support the development of these new customers. Mm. And that's what these organizations do really well. They, they have organization. They actually, amazingly, they're incredibly well run. They have a lot of process. So organization is really well structured. They are not chaotic environments. But because they have everything figured out, they don't have to figure out how to get things done. They can just focus on getting things done and doing these crazy things because they're spending no of their none of their energy, none of their attention focused on like organizational and process issues. Hmm. You, you talk about in your book, The Big Gulp. And, um, and you know, let's say that it, it, another, another term that I like is in a comparable space is bravery having the the courage to to do the thing that's gonna take you for one so how do you describe what is needed in order to be able to swallow that big gulp yeah um, i think bravery and courage happens when you you don't know what the outcome is going to be you're not a hundred percent sure but you know you have to go you know that the right thing to do is to go forward not backward or to stay where you are and that's where courage is so much needed, and that's where leadership is needed. 
So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is, this is a, a place where you know you're doing it right when you're just terrified. <laughs> it's incredibly scary, right? But you know you cannot turn back. You cannot stay where you are. So it's just this, staying where you are is failing. Yeah, so it's this notion of uncertainty that that that, that hurts the rational mind. You know, I, I want to... I want to get it all fixed up, but I want to know it all beforehand. And, and that uncertainty is highly destabilizing. Right. And what's amazing about these disruptive leaders is they're being very methodical. They're understanding all the risks. They're, getting, they're doing a lot of research. They're not doing this on the fly. That's just you know, closing your eyes and picking a number, right? Mm -hmm. That's throwing darts at the board. They're not doing that. They're being really methodical. But they don't know what they, they're not 100 percent sure it's going to be the right thing to do. It's not going to be 100 percent sure I'm going to get this ROI. But I think it's there. And if we can execute right, we think it's going to happen. But then they have that flexibility to say, let's try it. And if I'm proven wrong, that's great. That's great news. I, only, I know not to go in that direction anymore. Versus other organizations that may not be as disruptive and resilient see not, things not coming out that they're not pre being proven right. And they think it's disastrous because they're not going to be 100% right anymore. Hmm. Disruptive leaders go, well, that's great news. Now I can shift and know that's not the right direction. This is a better direction to go in. So that mindset is really different. And it allows these leaders to go in, make that big goal, take that big goal moment and know that they'll be able to navigate whatever comes their way. Well, it makes me consider, of course, different companies have different cultures, but different countries have different cultures too. And I, I have thoughts of certain large organizations in Asia, and I'm not obviously thinking about the likes of Tencent or Alibaba, but more maybe in Japan and Korea, where there's a a uh, higher need for consensus building before you do the big gulp. Have you did explored how that can be different in different cultures? Yes, I have. And and you find them, those big organizations, consensus driven organizations in every culture. And what I did is when I surveyed leaders in the US, UK, Germany, Brazil, and China, the US across the board was at the bottom <laughs> in terms of their ability, these leaders, their confidence to drive disruptive change. And Brazil and China were at the top. Hmm. And it was just recently in Brazil and, and asked an audience of over a thousand business leaders, like, so where are you on the scale? And again, confirmed they were significantly much more disruptive in their mindsets and in their actions than their counterparts in the U.S. Again, you never know because it, it could be this data and everything. But I find that uh, in, in Brazil and China, when I asked them about this, the leader said, look, you know, we see so much opportunity. There's so much change going on in our organization. We know that if you're not going after it, it will come after you. Hmm. So they're like, we just got to get out there. Hmm. Um, and so the opportunity has created this entire set of leaders who see themselves as more capable of driving disruptive change than their counterparts, especially in the U.S. and U.K., yeah, you mentioned this notion of, of privileging action uh, later on in the book. Um, you, you also say this sentence, and it was very, let's say, powerful to me. It said, creating and sustaining breakthrough growth is soul-sucking work, but someone has to do it. It feels for me that so much of business seems like that, not just the ones that are doing breakthrough work. And I, and I, always, feel, I always feel that the soul-sucking element of it is part of the problem. Right, and, and I, I don't go too much into it in the book about how to do this, but I'm, I'm very keen from a leadership perspective, how do you sustain yourself as a disruptive leader day after day, year after year, mm -hmm. over decades? Because that's what's needed. You can't pour it all out and then do it again next week over and over again. So that's part of the reason why I wanted to create quantum networks, mm -hmm. because when I, when I was talking to these leaders, and I'm like, well, where do you get your energy from? They go, man, it's just lonely being a disruptor because you're constantly pushing against the wall. And so what I'm talking about there in, in that section of the book is you need to pace this. This is really hard work. So finding the allies, finding the followers, um, building your networks 
building the organization and process, then we'll be able to support this as an organization is crucial. You can't do this alone. Yeah, and you need to make sure that things are feeding your soul. Otherwise, you'll feel soulless. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the reason why most people do disruption. We, we do it because we believe in the thing that we're trying to create change in. And that feeds our soul. Right. But the actual process of creating that change is, can be really difficult. I, I was recently debating with someone about this notion of big companies. And uh, let's say that the narrative for the last 20 years has been big companies are disappearing, their lifespans are shrinking. And yet, uh, we're now seeing in media, people are, are coming back to banner titles because they seem to be reputable, they, they sift through the, the noise, the curation, they're the reliable source. And there's something about big companies, in, a, in, in any event in media, that's coming back. And then you have these other large companies that just seem too big to be overturned. Uh, you know, in the States, they also change the way monopolies are considered. And the legislation and the legislators are completely bewildered and beyond ability to really actually understand what the new industries are. And I was just wondering, what, how, how would you react to that statement? Some companies are just too big to be overturned. Well, I, I think, first of all, let's deal with the first part that you make, in that big companies have a lot of resources behind them. The brand, the cash, they have existing customers. They have people. So they have an innate advantage when it comes to creating disruptive markets because uh, they can make a market literally overnight if they wanted to, if they could get out of their own way. That said, this is why I think companies like Google and Facebook, um, Amazon are incredibly powerful because they can disrupt and they use all of their assets to disrupt. And to your point, legislatures have not put in checks in the places where they need to be, I think, to say, well, are they growing in a responsible way? Are they using data, this incredibly powerful database uh, that's, that's in, a, in an anti-monopolistic way? So um, I have always been very skeptical of what legislatures can do. They've always proven that they have a hard time keeping up, but they also oftentimes do the right things. So uh, I think there's a time when we're going to have to look at the law that um, that protects platforms from having to take responsibilities like Facebook for the content that's on their platform. And frankly, I think Facebook's in a, in a really difficult position. Even if they wanted to, I don't know if they could monitor everything that's on their platform. So it's kind of an interesting intellectual and technology debate, but also a legislative and policy debate, too, as well. Yeah, in that case, they're actually just too big for their own boots at that level. Well, I don't know if they were, if you were to break them up, you know, separate Facebook, and some people talk about breaking them up, I, that the problem would still remain. Sure. Right? And, and they're fairly run as different companies, and you could not even break them up by just putting in some privacy legislation, which is what's happening in California now, that would protect us in terms of how the data is being shared. So there are ways to do this without having to break them up, but it still doesn't address the fundamental question and issue. Is does do we want Facebook in the middle of our stream determining what is good to be, what is considered good uh, to go up on our stream? Mm. And I think we all have an agreement of what is bad <laughs> and what is good. The danger is in the gray. So what determines that in the gray? Yeah, I think that there's still people who struggle on what is their ethical line. And you, well, I loved a lot of the stories and the cases you brought in the book, Charlene. Um, one of them was a real enlightenment for me, and I should have known about it beforehand, about how um, the CEO of Microsoft, um, Sadella, right? Um, Sachin Nadella. Sachin yes. Nadella, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. How he... Uh, made culture change as number one priority and promoted empathy. And I was like, hello, how did I not know about that? So in light of what you studied and understood, what, what do you think are the keys to actually making that culture change? Uh, again, if empathy is a place where you want to be talking about it um, or whatever culture change, it makes such a difference for your top leader to be really talking about it, living those values, 
um, setting an example for everybody else. But it also needs to be tied back to like, so what, what are these new beliefs? How will they drive us? How will we, how will it drive our business? How do we connect these ideas, these values uh, back into actual behaviors that will actually make sense from a business point of view? And Sacha did such a wonderful job. He says, look, we have to understand people as people, as humans, and we have to do that on a human level. That would be great for business. Because who, does, who wants to deal with a company? They want to deal with people. So he was able to say, this is, just, this is logical. This is natural. Why wouldn't you want to do business or work here? Because we have empathy um, and humility and all these other really powerful words that uh, a lot of people in business don't necessarily talk about. And he has always been that way. So mm. it was very natural for him. Uh, it was very interesting when, when Microsoft's board chose him to be the CEO. He was not one of the people that was sort of on the short list. He was on the list, but sort of in the back. And it, it, it was incredibly insightful of the board to select him as a CEO. Saying, I, I put a lot of, give a lot of credit to the board um, and to Bill Gates in particular for saying, this is the direction we want Microsoft to be going in. He strikes me as the kind of guy you'd like to have a long, fun, interesting weekend with and and learn from him on personal and professional level. Yeah, he. I basically like to say that he single-handedly gave Microsoft back its mojo. Hmm. He uh, he not only is this incredibly inspired leader from a personal point of view, but he's an incredible technologist too as well. He can talk tech like there's nobody else. Hmm. So, he, uh, he was a person who did search and he did um, search and he also did the cloud. But I mean, he has it all from a business standpoint. So the, the, it's kind of pushback that I will often get, especially from, let's say, middle tier managers, is that it all rides on the boss. It's top down change. So if you are Nadella and you are imbued with some you know wonderful karma humility you have a strong empathic muscle that's one type of leader but it's let's say not the regular one it's certainly not the one that wall street typically would clang on about or runs wall street banks for that matter how how does one go about if you're within the company trying to deal with this type of change when the top doesn't necessarily have the same kind of characteristics that you've just been talking about. Well, I, I look at it this way. If the top of the company is diametrically opposed to you, you probably shouldn't be there. You're the wrong place. If the, you're in the wrong place. So exercise the power of two feet and get out of there. and Find a place that is going to appreciate that. It, and I guarantee you they're there. I mean, I, 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 I talk to some people like, I've been pushing and pushing and they don't get it. I'm like, so why are you there still? Why are we at a company that's not appreciating you and, 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 and really taking advantage of your talents and what you have to give? Go someplace else that will. And the other part of it, though, is that if they're tolerant of it or if even better, if they're su supportive of it, but, you know, they wave the flag for you, but they don't do it, then there's hope. <laughs> okay, so um, and, and the question then gauges to say, do you have enough support to actually get the work done that you want? Do you need more support? Is the kind of change that you think is possible um, going to be possible without that top person? Well, how much of their support do you really need? Do they really need to show up and say the words? You know, what do you really need from them? And so I talk about executive buy-in, like be more specific about buying it. Do you want them to really believe it or do you just want them to go through the motions? Because mm -hmm. if you can just get them to go through the motions, that may be enough. Hmm. What about governance in, in uh, you know, my, my narrative in my book, I talk about the, the issue with being owned by a shark toothed VC type company or PE company, or let's say Wall Street's on your case. And how does governance and ownership change the ability for you to disrupt uh, in line with your philosophy of the disruption mindset? Yeah, I, I intentionally did not talk to founder-run <laughs> firms 
because they can do anything they want with their firms um, because they're the founders there. Most firms are not like that. And I think governance, this is why I'm, I'm so much focused on things like organization and boards. These are the fundamentals because if you do not have great governance, you can't do any of this. And so I think governance is a really important thing and I, I love governance and process for that reason and making sure you have the right structure the right ability to say yes like who can say yes be very clear on who can say yes not just who has the right to say no um, and, and I, I talked to quite a few of the disruptive leaders in, in the book and many of them said I had to replace my board because the board members I had some who had no idea um, some were completely standing in the way. And with the participation of my chairman, was able to get the right people on the board to provide that right guidance, to provide the right governance that we needed. Uh, and they were not always saying yes, but they would have that considered thoughtful way to help us meet this objective of disruptive change. Mm. So I think it's really important to have that throughout the organization about how, how do we, that we are aligned around our, our desire to create this exponential change. And then also, like, how will we actually get that done? And be really clear on what that process looks like. So if you had a magic wand, Charlene, and you, and you wanted to create the right board, what would you be starting with, with your fairy dust? What would you be looking for in having a good board? I would want a chairperson who would set the right culture. I mean, the culture of the board where there is freedom of discussion, anybody can raise issues, um, that there is this level of trust being built between the board and the executive team. And then making sure that you're putting people on there that reflect, a, a, reflect who your future customers are going to be. Oftentimes, they're going after certain titles or areas of expertise. You need to have that, but you can always call that in. Are there people here who are going to really drive the organization to understand who their customers are and to meet those needs and to hold the executive team accountable to say, are you really focusing enough on that future? Are you constantly thinking about who the future customers holding their feet to the fire and saying, what is your strategic plan going to be to drive this future? And part of that, again, is knowing that you may have to take short term losses to invest in that future. And the only way you can align everybody is if you have that future really clearly thought out and everybody aligns around, yes, that is the future we're willing to invest in. Including taking the hit short term. Yeah, I, I included the example of Adobe. With India, their mm -hmm. income was going to go down for two years. And this is a publicly traded company. And to just give you an idea, the CFO would go to Wall Street every quarter and say, literally, I have great news. Our income is down. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> because they were going through a business model shift. And every time the income went down, it meant that their business model was working. And their stock price literally would go up every time their income would go down. Yes, they went to the subscription model. Yeah, exactly. So in Chapter 5, um, of disruption mindset. You talk about the three beliefs, openness, agency, and action, which I was just mentioning at the beginning, as, as helping you to thrive and create these flux cultures. I love the notion of agency uh, for the employee. Tell us a little bit about the power of agency as you feel it and, and why it's so hard to put in place, in my opinion. Yes, well, agency is something that lives in people. And the difference, I think, is between agency and empowerment is that when you're empowered, you're waiting for somebody to give you the power, to bestow upon you the permission to go change. Agency says, I come in with the ability to create that change. I am a leader. I am an owner in the outcomes. And I have the power already to be able to make these changes because I'm aligned against what we're trying to do against that future customer. And more importantly, if I make that change, I'm going to be held accountable for that, the good and the bad that comes out of it. I know that I will own it. And that agency is incredibly difficult because you need to hire for it and then you need to also develop it and constantly reinforce to people, you have agency. You can control your outcomes. You have a voice that would be listened to. 
and constantly saying that over and over and over again to remind people because it's easy for us to fall back and like, okay, I'm just a cog, tell me what to do, right? Mm. Um, but you really are looking for people who are going to come in with agency and then are willing to exercise that. I, I think in my background, my baby step towards this concept that you so nicely put of agency was treat people like adults. And, and, and instead of writing a, a 16 page policy on how to do social media, write a three liner that basically says, be sensible, be accountable and and do good for the business. Right. And, you know, it's always great to say what that looks like and provide a more detail. But again, just having those high level things say, I trust you to do the right thing. And if you're not sure what the right thing is, go and ask somebody, check in with each other, talk to each other. And, um, and it's, so, it's such a great um, place to be when you have agency in that way. I'll tell you how agency also shows up. I, didn't, I, I talked just a little bit about it in the book, uh, which is this relationship between an employee and an employer looks really different. Uh, I think Reed Hoffman and Chris Ye describe it really well in their book, The Alliance. They call it a tour of duty. And we did this at Altimeter, too, which is we would talk about the day you leave, the day you start, meaning we acknowledge fully that you're going to leave someday. Hmm. I acknowledge that you are fully, you have complete control over your, your career. You're going to leave. So instead of um, looking around in two years' time, like going out and taking extra long, quote, lunches, and you're interviewing with people, let's have an agreement exercise your agency and say, I'm going to be leaving soon. I think my, my time here is coming to an end. Can you help me find my next job? And I'd be like, 100%. Can you help me find your replacement? Sure, happy to. That dialogue doesn't happen. But that's what agency looks like. Hmm. And wouldn't that be so much better for us as employers to have people have that frankness, to not have people leave with a two-week notice and you're left in the lurch? Yeah. Or, or the letter that says, gone on for personal reasons <laughs> right you know and, and instead of putting person on you know performance improvement plan at the end of that pip you realize you know this is not working but you have it right from the very beginning like i don't know if this is a good fit for you maybe we should be thinking about finding you another place and i will help you find a place where it will be a good fit help me find your replacement beautiful last question for you charlene what do you think 2020 holds uh, holds for us it's in store in terms of maybe breakthroughs or or big things to watch out for? You know, it's so funny. I hate predicting what's going to happen in the next few months mm-hmm. versus like, tell me what's going to happen in a couple of years. Yeah. A couple of things. I, I think, again, that we're going to be seeing this, this new type of dialogue happening. I think people are getting so, so tired of the division. We're saying, okay, I'm tired of this. Can we just talk about something else? Let's form bounds, bonds and and in connections with each other outside of these divisive areas. And when we start having conversations, real conversations with people that don't center around work, don't center around politics, really center on our families, our connections as humans, the things that move us and we're passionate about, we will learn to connect and get along with each other. And when we have those connections, then we can tackle the things that are hard. But we can't tackle the things that are hard without that foundational relationship that's there and I, i'm confident that i think the technology will allow us to do that i'm seeing it on the fringes where people are just saying look we got to stop this we're better humans than this so i hope that 2020 especially here in the u.s especially in other countries there's just so much division i think that the only way that we can hopefully keep it from going to that boiling point is that we look at each other and go we got to have dialogue we must have dialogue as a civil society. So if you're the leader of a company, then you need to be creating environments and embracing the opportunity for these types of conversations to be happening even at work. Yeah, I, um, what I really admire about these disruptive organizations, they do something really interesting. They slow down in order to go fast. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to take the time to really slow down, practice what Sachin Adela has, have empathy for each other, really stand in somebody else's shoes, understand what's going on in their lives. And that will form the foundation for us to just accelerate into a huge amount of change. But if we don't have that, then there's no way we can begin to really change. We don't have that common connection, that common sense of purpose. 
Love it. Charlene, how can someone, if you need another follower, uh, come and find out uh, more about you and, of course, get your new book? Well, you can follow me at my website, charlenelee.com. And my handle pretty much everywhere is Charlene Lee. Try to keep that branding very consistent across all the social uh, channels and would love to be able to connect with people. And as for the book? The book is called The Disruption Mindset. You can find it on all the online retailers and bookstores and also on my site, charlenelee.com uh, slash disruption dash mindset. Congratulations again, Charlene, on your wonderful book, Disruption Mindset. Recommend it to anyone and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Okay. Thank you so much, Minto. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why Come on.